Dimitri Metropolis? Good. <laughs> Dimitri Metropolis never tried to um, have the same effect on you, I see. Uh, I, I, I saw that review, and yeah. I, would, I would give the guy a D minus. <laughs> but I figured rather than feel outraged and publicize him by saying something negative and putrid, which yeah. would give him a chance to start a, a, a war, which would give him an opportunity to be possibly known by more people. I would just yes. keep a respectful silence and tell you I thank you for sending it. And yeah, I wanted I it provoked you a little I, bit. It, I, I didn't it, care for the review in certain ways. And, I, and I, it's funny, yeah. it's, he has so much to say and he throws in a few positives. And at the end, he gives the film a B minus, you know, I'm oh, sure the whole, the whole thing is stupid crazy. critic. He reminds me of so many people that I met decades ago who hate themselves, hate and are pathologically jealous of everybody and uses all that gossip and sexual innuendo and stuff. Right, there was a lot of that. Name somebody and make, and, and Joan Pizer did that in her miserable biographies. Oh, yes. Of attention. Now nobody reads her stuff anymore because she not only trashed Leonard Bernstein, but she trashed Pierre Boulez, who presumably she was a bigger supporter of than everyone else. And uh, Karma. And the nicest thing is that all those people, and they have books about Jack Kerouac and Kitty Kelly style biographies, get a lot of attention. And then they go in the landfill and are forgotten about and ignored unless <laughs> that person becomes really super prominent, which they never do, generally speaking. And you're not advertising basically a lot of crap. I, I, I wonder where he got that information about Metropolis, whom I dedicated my book to and knew, who encouraged me and everyone to, who was Jewish to, to celebrate that and whatever their heritage was to celebrate that. And he, David, and he, may I interpolate uh, to for Nenad and he, people? He, he, Greek music, which this, this has everything to do with the review of a new film, a documentary, Nenad about Leonard Bernstein. No, uh, and I said he was sent the review to David, and this, writing, these are his was, comments about right, the review. I sense very strongly, he was writing a review about himself and using <laughs> that as a way to get appreciated as a big time expert authority critic. And I met so many people like that. And I wish them all luck. And I, and one of the famous, I think Louis Armstrong said, I don't want no cats getting off at my funeral. Because in New Orleans, it was famous where people would come to the funeral and then hog the whole scene and get discovered by going a half hour overtime and performing and doing something. So to make a long story short, mm -hmm. I wish him luck. First time was fantastic. He deserves more than a B minus, whatever his faults were. So what? Everybody's got things that are that are faulty and unattractive and he was a great person he, he did so much for young people to get them interested in classical music which the guy didn't even mention and, and yeah. look, I want to go into it he did what he thought was right for him not for Leonard Bernstein or not for the film Doug, you look like D'Artagnan and I'm glad you sent it to me because uh, I didn't realize you know, I thought I thought the days of dumping on Leonard Bernstein were over, and now his right. music is being appreciated. And when the New York Times finally said he has matured, man, he was that good when he was what when I was a teenager, and he was conducting after he did he was he was great way back then. He's always been terrific, and always will be. And they finally because he was conducting the Vienna Philharmonic. And they liked him. They figure, well, if the Europeans like him, maybe he is good, even though he did write West Side Story and hang out with nobodies. That was the the snob Olaville anal retain. <laughs> you must be an unapproachable Nazi creep, as still lingers in the remains of what was once an attempt to create an establishment as a social climbing way to get invited to Buckingham Palace. But that's all mm -hmm. changed. Because now people, the few remaining people who forced their husbands to leave some money for the orchestras are now 
figuring math, there's people starving in the streets and all the stuff that's happening. Maybe we should give some of that money to someone else. So they had to revolve on corporations. And when they were struggling, they had the same thing saying, man, we got to do something to make the corporation look better. So the classic thing was the con CNN concert. They said, New York Philharmonic. Everybody said, boy, they're honoring that. And they had someone who's a wonderful actress who couldn't sing Puccini any better than you and I could, massacring Puccini, not because she's a bad person or not a great performer in what she does, but because someone with a lot of clout threw two stellar things together in the mixing pot. And, and uh, let's just say, Good taste always pays off and integrity pays off and garbage right. remains garbage no matter who's in charge of the garbage pit. Yeah. David, may I ask with your camera and, and then not, is it true? Like I don't, I only see David's forehead. Yeah, that's what Could I mean. David, cool? you, okay. you move. You're, you're wearing your camera like your mask. Is that better? <laughs> that yeah, better. Yeah, it's much, that's better. it. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's about content. I thought this was, this wasn't part of the program because I didn't mean to be trashing anybody publicly. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's not my scene. Our scene, I think, is to accept the beauty part, celebrate all those gifted, wonderful people, some of whom are world famous, many of whom, the predominant number of whom are totally unknown, but all of whom are contributing to the world and the planet. And will continue to do so no matter who's in charge and no matter what's happening. And there are always going to be people who are going to be negative and tear down, tear down the idols. And sometimes the false idols don't need any tearing down. They tear themselves down. So I would only say I was the first composer in residence with Bernstein. I never leaned on the family whom I love and respect for anything or for him after I was done my tenure, but I always admired him before I ever dreamed I'd be working with him. And a lot of other people did too. But without him, all of us would be working a day job. He and Van Cliburn were the two celebrated people in the 20th century when Van Cliburn played that one piece and miraculously won and had a ticker tape parade down Broadway. People said, well, even though he plays that classical stuff, let's book him because he's a star. And Leonard Bernstein was a star, but he also was a great musician. And I knew him and with all the stuff he had to deal with every day, including worldwide celebrity and fame and everything that goes with that. He never forgot about the music and he cared about the music and God bless him for that. And we need more people. He told me, he said, remember your job as the composer and the first composer in residence with the New York Philharmonic is to contribute, not just to please yourself, but to contribute something to the repertoire. Mm -hmm. A staggering thought in 1966, 67, when you were supposed to set the piano on fire and, and then dump it on the sidewalk, hoping it might not kill anybody in order to get more space in the New York Times when the third stream reviewer would come around by doing something so disgusting that you got attention. And the drop your drawers mentality infested everything, including the classical music world. And Bernstein was hip enough musically, spiritually, organically to be distinguished between what was saying something and what was a way to out ugly the opposition. And he got criticized for that and survived. And as, as far as being a composer, people said, well, anybody that writes West Side Story must really suck. And as fortunately, when I was told, whatever you do the first year you're at the Philharmonic, never mention to him West Side Story. About 15 years later, I'm not sure of the exact date, the wonderful PBS show showing him preparing the television broadcast that he conducted with opera singers who could hit the notes that he wrote and a killer orchestra that could play from the paper all the swinging music he had and the Latin music and have a sense of what that was about. They weren't improvising, they were reading off the paper, but they knew that language and were able to do that. And they had a huge reception. I hadn't seen them in a while. He said, oh, David, how are you? Then he said, 
did you see the show? And I said, oh my God, maybe he's talking about West Side Story, which I'd never mentioned. <laughs> and I said, which one, Lenny? And he said, you know, the West Side. I said, oh yes, it was fantastic. Because then I saw, and he said, you know, I was wrong. It was marvelous <laughs> with that big Lawrence. He actually wasn't from Boston, but he had to say he was because Lawrence was considered a funky town. Another thing he told me was, he said, David, I know you're a good friend of Jack Kerouac's. And he was a marvelous football <laughs> player. But just remember that famous touchdown that he scored where he beat us way back in the late 30s was certainly a great athletic skill on his part, represented great athletic skill. But Lawrence had a better team. And I said, man, who would believe all those years later that a guy that fought his way out of Lawrence and had to say he was from Boston in order to be almost accepted would, would still remember that he dug his hometown's football team. And he didn't say that to me to be published in the front page of the New York Times or a book I was writing. He just mentioned that in conversation. And he really cared about people and about music and about everybody appreciating all things of beauty, including the classical music, and not saying that you had to wear a funny hat and uh, join a cult or get a guru with a limo or a dope dealer in order to be cultivated or have pleasure. He just felt what was beautiful was beautiful and stayed beautiful. And he was so musical. Everything that he did when he played the piano, I remember, God, it was like incredible. I said, good Lord, Lenny, you playing that Mozart concerto. God, is that ever beautiful? You can play your ass, oh, pardon me. You can play your can off. In the, in the, and he said, oh, it's dreadful. I haven't practiced in 20 years. He was a vicious critic of himself and no one else. And that's why he was so good because he knew there was a higher level that none of us could get to, but he was trying to get there. And God bless him for that and for what he contributed to making classical music even exist. Wynton Marsalis has the same problem now. He's so surrounded by pathological jealousy that when people criticize him, I say, well, if you're pathologically jealous of the way he plays, I said, if I can play the horn as well as he can play his trumpet, and if I were able to compose music that the Philharmonic was dying to play, I'd be stuck up. So I think if you're jealous of Wynton, I recommend going home and practicing. <laughs> and that usually <laughs> ends the conversation. So you, you'd figure, and when I worked for the Lincoln Center Theater and they were downtown, all the, all the theater people that weren't there all despised it automatically because it was getting so much attention and it was so good and it was so much fun, and it was in Greenwich Village where everybody had a good time going there. And uh, I only say that because sometimes it's hard to distinguish between what's happening and what you're told is happening when the people who are covering it are embittered, frustrated people themselves and don't feel they can get anything out of it forgetting the fact that anybody who can get anything cultural out there is benefiting all of us, not only people who want to be artists, but parents and children and grandparents and people who would like to be able to see and be part of something beautiful. And that's why so many of us admire you, even though I'm in BMI, which is supposed to be a rival of ASCAP, man, you've done more for friends of mine and me for appreciating and encouraging us and others to pay attention to what we're doing than most of the people that I know, including those who presumably are representing me. And you also go out and encourage young singers and young classical conductors and soloists and everybody to hang in there and to do it, you know, rather, rather than saying, I'm in a position of authority and my only comment is you suck. That's not exactly the way it's phrased. But that's after you're dumped upon several hundred times yourself, you can distinguish between those whose 
feel that they are in a position to dump on everybody and those who actually care about the arts and want to see other people enjoy them. Well, David, the distinction there, it's uh, always appreciation for the creative people. You know, those are, you know, we should always respect that and there's not enough respect in the whole totality of music and artistic yeah. achievement. And, and uh, it's just a humble response because uh, honestly, I don't have it. And people like you are blessing this planet. You know, you're giving us something very special and you deserve all, you know, all the more support. And I wish there could be, you know, ways to manipulate things your way even more. And to, you know, Nenad is such Doug Yeager who's sitting there, like we're the support team. You should feel like you have good friends who really appreciate what you're doing. Well, and we're even making a little bit of a living about it. So that's not a bad thing. And if one person appreciates me, I always tell kids now that I'm doing a little better. I say, if the band outnumbers the audience, you're a big hit. And when I met Nemeth the third week he came to New York and I was playing at Brad or hanging out at Bradley's, I can't remember if I was playing there that night or not. I think I was playing. You were playing French horn. Yeah, and it was so much fun. Wow. And I knew I didn't. I, I knew where Croatia was. <laughs> I visited there a long, long time ago in Dubrovnik, and always loved. Dubrovnik. And and uh, and I knew the time, but basically, but I just saw this guy, and I just fell. I said, "Man, this cat, this is a hell of a person." And thirty-six years later, I still feel that way. And, and with all the great stuff you've done, Nemet, you never got that. I am a star and you are nobody go shove it type personality, which you're encouraged to do by those who say, now that you've risen above your miserable former self, you can abandon everything, your heritage, your roots, your family, your friends, your those ideals and, and, and join in the abuse of creep department. And I always help kids, being an abusive, narcissistic, swinish, disgusting, disrespectful creep is an overcrowded field and a non-growth industry. So it's better to take the other side and not be vindictive or revengeful against those people because then you're, you're the other side of the same coin. But just to figure, well, Miles Davis said it perfectly when he called that song, So What? It's there, is there, always will be there. But you leave that to the experts, and there are plenty of experts in that department. So all of us just can take our lunch pails behind Beethoven, Mozart, Chaucer, Charlie Parker, and Rembrandt, and do the best we can and hope for the best. And I wish Dr. Nemed, excuse me, Dr. Ne Nenid, that's the way I used to misprove, Dr. Nidi was here because She's, She's here. here. She's here. There she is. I see her. Great. Hello. Hi, David. Hi, and thank you for coming on because I was hoping you could get a chance to say something about your field of medicine and what oh, you yeah. hope to contribute, especially to the young people who want to be doctors, lawyers, and that kind of thing, to realize that you can do something and survive for, but also think of how you can make a contribution while you're here. So I yeah. give floor and I will stop my turn of hot air <laughs> the audience gets asphyxiated and listen to you. Well, thank you, David. I'm, it's an honor to be even be a part of this. I'm really happy to learn from you. Um, I love learning from every interaction I have with everyone and especially um, from all of you have so much wisdom to share. Um, in my field, um, I hope to contribute um, a lot to humanity in terms of, I want to transform medicine into something more holistic. I want it to be less about just, you know, writing prescriptions and more about really showing people we care. And a lot of times when patients come in, they just, they want to be heard. They want a little bit of caring. Um, you know, nowadays with technology, it's technically so easy for all of us to connect, but for some reason, people are feeling more lonely than ever. So um, <laughs> reaching out to everyone and making sure we're, you know, being heard and feeling connected is really important nowadays. So 
um, like a lot of what we suffer from, it just arises from within the mind. So that's why I think mental health needs to be transformed and wow. uh, emphasized. And there needs to be like better technology to help address those issues. So yeah, I want to help do something new and innovative. I want to add some creativity, use some tech, maybe some AI um, in a positive way that can help bring people together and start healing from within. Hmm. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. If I could just interject for a second, but please don't go away. I hope anybody viewing this besides the four of us will listen and pay attention to what Dr. Nitty said, because we're trained, those of us who think maybe I'll go into the fine arts, <laughs> that everybody else in every other field is the enemy because they've got, they might have a real job someday. And actually, everybody is faced with the same problem. And when I was asked by my father being brought up on a farm during the depression, he said, David, what do you want to do when you grow up? He was hoping he, he became a law teacher, although he was a full time farmer in his early life and continued being a farmer. He never slept, which is a good role model. But I was out there in my tractor. I said, Daddy, I want to be a farmer like you were, like you still are. And he said, no, it's hopeless. He said, small, small family farms. This was in the 1939. A 160 acre farm was already in peril, which he was able to see. He said, what else? And I said, well, I like to be a jazz musician and a classical composer. And he said, that's worse. So therefore, my career options being zero meant I had no place to go but up. And fortunately, one of my mother's cousins, Ralph Goldsmith, was a doctor. So naturally, he was every Jewish parent's dream of a successful person because he had a gig. <laughs> he got paid every week and was something that was considered to be distinguished rather than being a psychotic nutcase that was wanted to be an artist or a farmer guaranteed to go kill yourself working and go bankrupt and have to have another job. So he was so nice and and he kind of consoled me he said david i know other people in your family think you must be nuts to want to dare to be classical composer and a jazz musician either one of which is hopeless supposedly he said but you know as a doctor the best i can do is to take someone and try to help out to rebuild what it is that they have destroyed within them that's what I do as a surgeon. He said, but you guys, you can create something from nothing. And that's a very beautiful thing. And he was the person, first person that ever told me it was okay to dare to dream. So the point I would make is all of listeners who dream of doing something, try and hang out with some doctors and lawyers and chefs who know how to really cook and carpenters who really know how to do a good job and plumbers and scientists and anybody who does a good job starts from the beginning goes to the end and cares about what they're doing and cares about what their people that they're working for and does not accept the american dream of P.T. Barnum, there's a sucker born every minute, or the new age thing of it doesn't make any difference. You can just be famous for five minutes. That's all Philistine shortcut, worthless, non-goals. And of course, it's easy to accept those, those uh, little cliches as being an excuse for not caring about anything, including yourself and your family and your work and the rest of the world. And conversely, not to become a, I am a do-gooder by helping out the disadvantaged subhumans, because that's what they call slumming. And that ain't cool either. It's just to try to get back to the basic nitty gritty. And you, you're one of the first scientists I've met in a long time who actually has thought about that before they are accepted as being being a top dog and then saying, okay, you can name the hospital wing after me, but then go ahead and 
I'll have to join the full greed ahead contingent because that's considered to be who's the most valuable. So that's a little thank you to you for for coming on, for helping this to get organized and, and making us all feel enlightened. Well, of course, <laughs> enlightenment, I think. Uh, I, honestly, I feel with every interaction with, with someone, even if they're very young or very old or where, somewhere in between, I feel like there is something I always learn from every, every interaction, um, however small, either reinforcing a lesson I've learned before or, or just something new. And I think it's really important what you mentioned about value, because um, how I see it is, I think um, it's really great for people to follow their passions. Um, actually, my first love was the arts. So uh, I actually was really into writing stories and, and into art and music as a child, actually. And I got kind of, I already liked, um, you know, humanitarian stuff as when I was six, seven years old, I was thinking of ways to set up orphanages um, which is not very a common dream of a six-year-old. And so I always knew I was going to be in a field where I'd interact with people and just try to share love and um, care for them. And I feel like uh, whatever someone does, if they do it well, they can feel really good, um, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be like, what you know, for example, with um, Indian families, they measure success as, oh, are you a, a lawyer? Are you a doctor? But for me, I see success as people doing what they feel uh, their heart is pulling them towards and doing their best in that. And I think that's what success is. And I think it's what really value is, is um, when we follow our, our heart and just don't listen to people who are trying to limit you and just expand beyond, so. Great. Mm -hmm. well, for, for the listeners who who also, like Dr. Nitti, are planning on entering that field, Boradin, one of the great 19th century composers, has a textbook today, it's chemist. 150 years ago, I guess it was that he wrote that, I'm not positive of the exact date, a, a textbook on chemistry, which is still used in Russia, way before Joseph Stalin showed up on the scene, and still used today, is still used as a textbook, because he was a great chemist. And Chekhov, the wonderful playwright, whom I'm sure you've all heard of, also was a doctor, and a very and continued working as a doctor that wrote all those great plays and helped the whole theater to change in the 19th century to what we are still dealing with today. They were both doctors. And, and I've worked with, as many musicians have, with doctors' orchestras and doctors' jazz ensembles and symphony orchestras of doctor. They're called doctors' orchestras. And they're terrific. And a lot of dentists that I know are really good sculptors because they can deal with that amazing precision like Yasha Heifetz playing the violin, you can't play, get away with playing a clicker. And when you're doing doing some tiny thing with someone's tooth, you can't say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I pulled out the wrong one, or, the, or this, I was putting a filling in incorrectly. You know, that's precise. And and there's so many interesting things. And Nemet, I know you're, you, you don't call yourself a doctor, but you found out with the Parkinson's Foundation, which I never knew about so you, I read about it, and then you told me it was true, how you're able to do ping pong and use that as a healing, helpful way for people who have Parkinson's, to, not only to play a great international sport, but to use that in a medicinal healing way, in addition to all the work that you've done in, in music and helping to save the world and what you've done to bring liberty back to Croatia someday. So maybe you could say something about Nemet since it's, it's your show and you never, I requested if you could say something on the program, you have a constitutional right as an American citizen and also for Dr. Nitty to say something. So if I could make a, a request, could you say something about that? Sure. I'm, I'm looking for my medal that I received. 
too busy. <laughs> I, I got a silver medal in, in mixed doubles in, oh. the, in the German Open ping pong Parkinson. But anyway. Congratulations. And I, you're in Berlin right Congrats. now. Yeah, I'm in right? Berlin right now, yes. And I got from, from British society the, the medal uh, from ping pong Parkinson, you see. Wow. We build neurons. Yeah. I had the honor to play with Nenad when it was a foursome. And let me tell you, he's a very fearsome player. You don't want to go against Nenad. Yeah, and this you is know another, how to play ping pong. Another reward that I got globe glass from International Table Tennis Federation. Anyway, but uh, uh, first of all, I wanted to say how needy he is so eloquent that I, yes. I, I'm very impressed with your, with your uh, ergonomical way of speaking. First, that you 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 speak in few words but say a lot. Mm. And now I will I will re rewind the tape and listen to again what you have <laughs> said, because I, I really I really I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's ergonomical speaking is is a, is a virtue and very rare commodity. Mm -hmm. yeah. People wow. say, <laughs> yeah. well, thank you so much, Nana. <laughs> you, you see, you're so kind. I just uh, I like to put a lot of heart into everything. So um, I practice a lot of mindful meditation. And I practice a lot in uh, being very meaningful with every moment and, and thought, because I think thoughts translate into our actions, whether they're subconscious and later conscious. So I just, I just speak from the heart. <laughs> so Doug, what do you have to say about that? Well, I, I was thinking as Dr. Needy was speaking, uh, the, there's been a lot of conversation this past year, especially since the Olympics, where the two wonderful young women, you know, came out and, and said that they, they could not be part of press conferences because it caused them too much stress and they couldn't perform. One as a, a gymnast and, and one as a golfer or tennis player, excuse me. And um, people don't think enough, as Dr. Needy was saying, about mental health. And, and they don't think that most people don't realize that it's an illness just like having diabetes or, or any other illness and it has to be treated properly. And it's, a, I think, an important subject to be discussed today. And, and I'm glad that that's important in your study and research and the work that you're doing now, Dr. Needy. Yes. Thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, I think how I see um, mental health is I feel like there are more people suffering than we hear about generally. I feel like um, with mental health, I feel the way people see it is maybe they don't seek help until it's very emergent and affecting them very deeply, but rather I see it as there as no real normal, but a little spectrum of various traumas everyone has. I, I don't know if I've ever met anyone who hasn't been affected by some kind of trauma from their childhood or sometime in their past. And so I feel a lot of us go around and, you know, we ask each other, how are you? But how often do people share how they really feel? I feel a lot of people experience loneliness, depression, and maybe it's not meeting all the criteria to be able to be diagnosed and treated with medication. But I feel there's way more people than people realize that actually are affected day to day, especially with the pandemic. Um, and just anxiety seems to be something that nearly everyone's affected with um, in some form or at least sometimes in their life. So that's why I feel like it's really important to maybe change the way it's being viewed. Um, and yeah, so hopefully there can be some positive changes in that field. I've had I've had friends who have taken their own lives, suicide. And um, all the other friends said, gee, why didn't they tell me? And, uh, you know, maybe I could have. And 
I, I think we all need to kind of look deeper into our friends and make sure there aren't some telltale signs, even subliminally, that could tell us how troubled they are. And um, and and so, but it's just a, a a real painful experience when a friend commits suicide, and and probably more painful because we, their friends, didn't realize that maybe we could have helped them and we didn't. Yeah. Well, can I make one little point too, in terms of what you said with those ten? Hey, David, can I interrupt? Is your camera on? Because I'm not seeing you. You're lucky. Okay. Just about Somehow was it turned off? Oh, I, I, oh, there. Oh, great. And Go and ahead. Michael, Michael, we can't see the top half of oh. your head because <laughs> okay. your baseball cap is shading it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. About the men, those tennis players that you refer to, one of the terrific things that came out was the fact that those young women are treated like dogs except not as well, otherwise the SPCA would come out and close it down because the people are concerned about how we treat animals. We forget the fact that these tennis players are very gifted human beings who are in the athletic field and that the way, they're, the way they described, which I never knew, was they're all huddled together, have to go for weeks jammed into a room, getting hardly any rest, playing around the clock. And one of them mentioned the most difficult thing was after the whole thing of playing a tennis match, which is pretty exhausting. We can watch that on, on you get tired, say, man, how can those young women do that? Then after the tennis match is over, rather than being able to cool down and, and and relax and say, thank God we I got through it. They have to go to a press conference immediately after doing that without the chance to calm down. And whether they won or lost are expected to be charming. And they said, in addition to that, they're interviewed primarily by people who never played tennis, who want to know about gossip about their personal life that they had when they weren't on court or had maybe before they played tennis or would like to have, and weren't even weren't even usually interviewed by people who asked them about tennis. And that I think was part of their problem. And the way we treated gymnasts way before Lester the Molester, I can't remember which one we're referring to, came along. And 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 those poor young women were at 13 or 14 were being starved to death getting arthritis when they were 20 years old and one of them would be the darling coddled and the rest of them would be treated just the way you wouldn't treat a dog or a cat or a chipmunk certainly not your own child and i wanted to say that because a lot of them it was portrayed in the press that the, the mental issue health is certainly god knows important but that these were some exceptional people who who were sick and needed help, or there, or they were something wrong with them because they wouldn't get out and compete and slaughter the opposition. And I wanted to say that because the idea of sports and the idea of the Olympics and the idea of any competitive sport, there's supposed to be sportsman or sportswomanship after it's over. And that's one of the reasons why in boxing, as disgusting as the business of boxing must be, there's a certain bravery and camaraderie and, and in baseball and basketball games after those games are over the people hug each other and talk to each other and congratulate each other and that's a beautiful thing and that's the nicest part of the olympics when they show the people all getting together after it's over and dancing and and shaking hands and congratulating one another and that's a very moving thing that you still see and that's i think what makes those sports so great. And when we transfer the full greed ahead philosophy of there's a winner and there's a loser and the loser is no longer part of the human planet, that's got to mess up everybody's mental health, including those of us who witness that and aren't aware that that ain't cool. Yeah. David, do you mind if I ask a question about your boxing background? This is the medal that I found. 
Ah, oh. wonderful. Beautiful. Thank <laughs> Parkinson. When we we hug each other after the, the defeat or victory. Doesn't matter. Right. We are not attached to the outcome. What but, what hotel are you staying in, Nate? I'm staying in uh, Sense City, in 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 Sp 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 how do you, uh, Spandau. In Spandau. Oh. That it's has a history, close, as you mentioned at the beginning. Very close to the to the bridge where they exchange the spies. Right. Uh, uh, very maybe maybe 300 yards from the, that place, and I walked yesterday, and they told me about history. You know, it, it's it's uh, difficult to imagine that 40 years ago, it was a, a war between West and East, and 80 years ago Hitler w w walked these streets. So and today, you can walk freely like 3 a.m. and and nothing will happen to you. So I guess we progressed at least a little bit. I, I love Berlin and I know exactly where you're staying. And the Spandau prison where Albert Speer right. and, and others uh, spent most of their life. Uh, it, it is uh, remarkable how that city has transformed. Mm -hmm. But uh, Michael wanted to ask David about his boxing years. Yeah, it's just, uh, I think, a fascination maybe for anyone out there who wonders that David Amram actually has a background. I, and, and what that background is, David, if you could tell us a little bit about what intrigued you about boxing and what is it like the most altruistic guy on the planet that I know has a killer instinct in him? Like, I mean, how could you not if you're a boxer and how do you deal with that and why? What is it about boxing that intrigues you? basically as self-protection. When I was a little boy on the farm in Feasterville, Pennsylvania, I went to the public school in nearby Southampton. There were th young, three young African-American kids, and I was the only person of the Hebraic persuasion, that's say <laughs> Jewish, in the whole school. So the three uh, African-American kids and myself were had to battle every day, whether we wanted to or not, because after we were called names, then people wanted to punch us out. So my father said, you have to understand the social conditions with the German American Bund being in this, where we lived in the country and the people oh. especially being out of a job. So they couldn't, they had to blame it on someone. So they, they picked on black people and on me as, as the reason why they were having such a hard time. He said, you have to understand that, but you have to be proud of your heritage understand everyone has a heritage. And if you're forced to fight, you have to learn to defend yourself, not to go out and drop a bomb on everybody, just to defend yourself if you can't talk your way out of it. So after you try diplomacy and that doesn't, right. so I, I started learning how to box. Then I saw the really good boxers. And when I was in Washington, DC, which was kind of a uh, during World War II, when my folks sold the farm. That was at that particular juncture was kind of a rough period. And boxing was something that everyone did as a sport and also for self-defense. So I learned more about that. Then I began to see really good boxers. Finally, and I boxed in the Boy Scouts. I was a gym teacher. Then I went in the army and there was a big dispute and I had to be fight with someone and I won. So then everybody th thought I was some kind of a big he-man. I said, no, man, I'm just, I'm, I was more like the little pep school of not getting hit as much as a fancy Dan, I called it. And I saw some really good boxers and said, you know, since I was born with a sizable schnoz, and still, <laughs> I wanted to play the French horn. I figured I might have a problem breathing with the deviated septum. And if my teeth were knocked out, it, would, my, it was hard enough playing the horn anyway. So I retired from that. And, uh, but I did get to appreciate the gifts and the, the ESP in all sports, including boxing, where you could see what the person was trying to do and how the other person was relating to that and how someone like Muhammad Ali and so, Willie Pep and so many others would do things where you'd have to watch the playback 
about seven times to see what they were doing and what they were not doing. And then ultimately, the sportsmanship involved, the people who were doing all that brutal stuff, somehow at the end of it, hug one another. All the boxers that I have known personally always loved that as a sport and had a certain gallantry and a certain dignity and a non-violent way of living that really was very moving to me. The, the, the politics and the business of boxing are disgusting as much of popular music has been. But if it's, you can't really blame the people who control it, that's the best they can do. But you certainly cannot equate people who are criminal types who run things with those who are doing the work in anything. So boxing is kind of a metaphor for survival. And there's a certain beauty which you can also find in, in basketball and in many other sports where, where it's not only what they're doing, but what they're not doing and how they can do things together. That's like miraculous in basketball. I still, you still can't figure it out to you how anybody could possibly see anybody else or in hockey or any of those sports. They're all wonderful. And they all involve teamwork. And boxing is really basically one person versus another person. But then when you see what the corners do and the psychology that they use to try to get their boxers to succeed, it's really interesting. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody as a profession. And I'm sure that eventually it'll be outlawed, which might be a good thing, except then they're going to have it it will really be horrible because there won't be any protection. And now, fortunately, they're beginning to finally have some addressing the neurological effects of boxing and the neurological effects of professional football. The people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s have more than Parkinson's. They're just completely annihilated because their, their brain has been bashed around too much. Mm -hmm. You can, if oh, you can, you. if you can check uh, uh, on the under the chat, there is a the screenshot. If you can open it, click that in the chat. There is a screenshot. If you can click on and open that, please, and tell me what you see. Uh, oh. Okay, I have participants chat share screen. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. Just click on the sh screenshot. In, 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 in chat. Chat, okay. You see screenshot? No, it, it wants us to download at that point. Do we oh, just click, save click, click, click to open? Click to open. Is that the green arrow that says share screen? Yes. No, no, no. no, 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 share no. Chat. chat. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go to the chat below. And then you see screenshot. But but as uh, Spudik said, it uh, wants you to download it. Just, it just, says click to download, may not. So click to download, please. Oh. And if one does that, we have to save it. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I'll save it in my video. See, see this is what I found a few days ago in my old house. Believe it or not. I wanted to ask Dr. Nitty, do you have any experience with people who, who've been playing football? She, 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 had to, she had to take a phone call. She's on call. Uh oh. So she apologized uh, me with text. Uh, she will come, come back when, when, the, uh, when the phone call ends. Right. That was but, a truly fascinating discussion. But, not but, but open the screenshot, please. Yeah, I, I, I'm not having I, success. Me neither, and I'm also losing. Uh, the only person I see now is Ninad, and everyone else oh. is gone. Um, you, oh, there you are, Doug. It, it, is, uh, it is the book, Vibrations, The Adventures and Musical Times of David Amram. <laughs> okay. Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> I found it on, on, in my- David in knows my it well. Head. A library. Oh, thank you. David, can you open it? Me? Yeah. I don't see it either. 
I have you, a shelf. You, I've never read it all. <laughs> Thank mm. you for doing that. I should mention too, all three of my books now at 2021 are reissued for God knows how many times by Routledge Taylor, uh, Routledge Taylor Francis, a huge English publisher that doesn't put them on hold. So for all of you young writers who can't get a publisher, Sterling Lord, who was Jack Kerouac's agent, said, David, congratulations, you just beat Jack's record. This was about 20 years ago. So what do you mean? He said, you got 26 rejections for On the Road. You got your 27th rejection. Unfortunately, a wonderful young man named Dean, Dean Birkenkamp. Dean Birkenkamp told me he loved everything I'd done and wanted to publish all my stuff. And my first instinct was, wait a minute. If the guy thinks I'm any good, he must not be any good because the other 26 uh -oh. that forget about it. Then I only mention that because all you need is one yes. And for all the people who know that's they have a constitutional right to do that too. But just look for that one yes. So if you hit a bump in the road, don't get discouraged. Or even if you're discouraged, don't quit. And if you do quit, make a comeback. I make about nine comebacks a week on everything. Just keep on trucking because there's only one you and no one has a story like you. So you just tell your story in writing, music, literature, life, and then hope for the best. <laughs> in the music business, I always tell young artists that after the Beatles had a million selling hit in the UK, their first hit record, they were then shopped to all the American labels and 17 American labels turned them down. Hmm. <laughs> but the last 17? one, but the, the, the last one uh, who did not turn them down became very wealthy from it. <laughs> Lucky 18. It's a good Jewish number, right, David? 18. Well, the nice thing is that that didn't stop the Beatles from what they were doing. And the extraordinary thing, Doug, that's a good story, man, which I never heard. But they, they can not to do I want to hold your hand, but to go into their own amazing stuff. And now 50 years later, we can listen to that. And it still sounds good because it was good music and it was something they wanted to do. And they had a lot of help and did it very successfully and had great recordings. But those songs, kind of amazing, the structure and the way they were put together, their stuff still sounds good. And I dare say, like the great writers of the Hoagie Carmichael and all the other people that we love and admire, George Gershwin and Ira Gershwin and so Cole Porter and so many other people, uh, some some of uh, Scott Joplin's music, like his Tree Manisha, which was shown for the first time stage 60 years after he died. That stuff still sounds good, just like Bach and Beethoven and the Lascaux cave paintings of 25,000 years ago. And people pay money to go to southern France and pay money to go inside that cave and see what those guys did. And to the best of my knowledge, no one has asked for a refund because what they did was from the heart and built to last. And that's something that all of us can be glad is there. There are standards. And with the magic of the Internet, it's possible for stuff to sneak through the trapdoor and be available to give viewers of any age, any persuasion, a choice to see that there is stuff that's not destined for the landfill. And there are things of beauty in dance, music, philosophy, medicine, sports that are worthwhile and worthy to study and worthy to enjoy. And mentioning Germany, Doug and I are both invited to Karlsruhe, Germany, ZKM. I'm supposed to be introducing Splendor in the Grass, which I composed the score for in German, Auf Deutsch. But from that, yeah. the Doug's genius and a lot of patience, 
they found an old out of print out of nothing damaged recording done off the air American Armed Forces Network radio which has been restored Arm, they don't even have the Armed Forces radio it doesn't have it in their archive apparently but someone got this old seat uh, we don't even know who recorded it off the air then it's been taken to someone else now my son who's a terrific musician himself and a tech wizard has a friend who's who's restoring it so it'll actually sound good and ZKM where I'm giving the lecture has a recording I made with a group of young jazz artists in 2013 so they're going to put out something and the hopes for that is it'll show people a 23 year old which I was when I made that record in the autumn of 1954 not the record David the what was it that they found actually it was a recording of what was that it was a recording acetate that someone got made a scratch scratchola copy of disappeared showed up again anonymously will lay around for 25 years and then the trombone player Albert Mengelsdorf who was got so famous it was acknowledged because it was something he played on early in his life and then all and this and now years later all that's going to come out now it'll look to people who hear about it like oh man they must have planned that with a career counselor and a lawyer and this just happened as a result of hard work trying to do something good and having the good luck of having it preserved and having somebody like Doug Yeager in my corner who was able to put together Online. impossible stuff so I'd recommend to all of you hang in there do the best you can and hang out to all of you help you out represent you try to get someone who's honest who shares the same values as you and who is on the case not a well-meaning space cadet of whatever that's fine for the sopranos but it's not really helpful in in the in the arts so we, we all have to be responsible and and level-headed and i say that because of my association with Jack Kerouac and other people, people assume my philosophy is screw everything that happened before 1955 and nothing's worth anything. Let's all just get high and hang out and lie around and get stoned and something miraculous will happen. Actually, you just got to work your can off the way someone does who's <laughs> delivering, you know, delivering the groceries or, or mopping the floor or managing a farm or doing woodwork or plumbing or laundry or sports or brain surgery. Radoslav. Where? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> hey, <Wow>. hey. <laughs> Look Hello. at this. Are you are you still in Croatia? I'm in Zagreb right now. <laughs> oh my God! I'm just a Croatian hangout, I, may not. Oh I'm, my gosh. Yeah, man. I, <laughs> I'm I'm in a restaurant with my mom and her cousin, <laughs> <laughs> and I busted away, you know, because they're just chatting away, getting caught up in all the good gossip. <laughs> been, been looking at your photos on Facebook. You, how long have you been there now? Oh, geez, about five weeks. It's wow. been, it's been awesome. Yeah, it's been awesome. And how long? A, are, how lo much longer will you stay? I think another three. You know, we're 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 out. The cruise is going to head out in a in a couple three day couple days. We're heading out. That's about eight nine days, and then I got another week after that. Wow! So yeah, yeah. David, Doug, you two have to go on a Croatian cruise on the Adriatic and do something. Come on! I would, I would love to. Yeah. I will be yeah. on Zagreb. I will be on 13th in Zagreb. That's uh, in a week, I guess, or less. In Zagreb, I will be on oh. the 13th. Oh wow! We're so, we're on the coast. God, that, yeah, we we leave we leave the 11th. We leave the 11th. Um, I guess it's Saturday morning. We take off. We're taking the whole group to Plitice, and then we start in Zadar, and then go down to Dubrovnik. Great. Nice. And when are you yeah. Zagreb? When are you? When will you be back in Zagreb? Um, no, I, we're, I'm going to fly out of Dubrovnik. Okay. So okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll be back in Kvar for a little bit, but just to Kvar and then back down. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I'll be back in Zagreb, but probably because there's family stuff I have to deal with here. 
So I'll probably be here maybe November, or late October, something like that. So like in US, we will miss each other. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. Man, it'd be great to see. I remember the last time we, we met under the, the horse. That was great. <laughs> Scott, can I say something about you? Because you'd be too modest. And for, in case any viewers aren't familiar, Radislav, known as Rad, every festival <laughs> he goes to, including Woody Fest for the last 15 years where we've been, everyone there has one mantra instead of saying namaste or or, some, or um, they say, get rad. So we <laughs> say, no, if he's on the scene playing the, uh, not the accordion, but it's like an accordion or the piano or singing or doing anything, it's going to be 10 times better with him. And that's why people all over the world try to hire him to play with them. And also he's a, a phenomenal singer songwriter himself and written and sang as, as beautiful as anything I've ever heard in my life. And in my own case, when we were jamming at some little crazy place, a woman heard us, T Kathy T-shirt wolves. And she has to come down to Florida. We're doing our program and play two pianos together. Had done that. That was amazing. Well, we, that we, was the highlight. But we ended up doing that and I had this Chinese horn and I was supposed to write a piece for the Harvard Wind Ensemble, and I thought the second movement I wanted to use the the Wayfaring Stranger. So I wrote out some chord changes, which which it spent about two weeks, just so I figured maybe I could play with Rad. And we played it together. What he played just from those little sheet of the chord changes, said, God Almighty, that could be a great classical piece. So the second movement of the symphony piece, the wind symphony piece, is because of what I played with Rad and decided he inspired me to actually make a classical piece. I only mention that because 30 years from now, when all the people are playing that, they're not going to know it was because of Radislav Lorkovic. I was able to <laughs> use that in a symphony piece and expand upon it. And I only say that to you because if you meet someone that you like and admire, hang out with them and you <laughs> know the blessings that will come your way. And of course, Radislav also played with the great Odetta who loved him. And when I heard them play in New York, they had a, a $13 piano in the little place on Avenue C. And, and she was being honored. That was the worst piano I've ever seen. And boy, he made it sound like a Steinway Grand. And, and, <laughs> and, and that was and helped, a great thing. That helped Odetta in the last 20 or 30 years to finally achieve again the prominence that she deserves as one of our great singers. And she loved Rad. And, and Odetta was not noted for throwing out the compliments. Let, let, me, just, <laughs> let, let me just relate a story. Uh, Rad was on tour with Odetta um, when she almost died. And the, the doctors thought she was going to check out. Um, they started in, in uh, I think, Vancouver or yep. Seattle, then came yep. south. And yep. she caught a cold and it kept getting worse and worse. And uh, <clears throat> they got to Mill Valley and the theater was sold out, uh, but Odetta couldn't get out of bed to go over and do the show. And uh, Wavy Gravy and other friends who were at the concert that came and they did a sit in in uh, Odetta's hotel room to force her to go to the hospital. And then there was a, a lady there who sympathized with what was going on and asked Rod if, if he wanted to stay, that he could stay at her house. And whereas most musicians would have said, well, it's, my gig is over, so I'm going to fly back to another gig. He stayed with Odetta until she got out of the hospital. And uh, most musicians wouldn't do that. And I have great admiration and appreciation and love for Radislav because of that. Oh, man. But, I, all, but I also remember that the lady you stayed with, you reminded me she had a beautiful grand piano. She had a terrific piano, terrific <laughs> place, and she had the cutest dog. And the dog and I was a little, little thing was about 12 inches long. And the dog and I hiked up my, Mount Tam every day, which is like a 3,000 foot mountain. <laughs> wow. 
10 days, 10 trips up Mount Tam. It was awesome. <laughs> Hey, I had to join a, a Zoom meeting. Hey, meet, this is my mom, oh. everybody. Hello, hello, hello. This is, this is, Hi, mom. This is, this is Dave, Doug Yeager. Hello. He is Odetta's manager. Oh, hello. Yeah. And uh, that's Mrs. Yeager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's me. That's okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, uh, where are you in the hotel? In, they're in New York. Are you in New York? Okay. 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 Okay, guys. So, so oh, you, man. you're remembering all your old language from a kid? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're, yeah. You're, you're now a fluent Croatian speaker. Oh, da, 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 bez problema, da, to, da mislim, nadam se, ali <laughs> my, my, uh, my mom informed me that, that I, I speak only the Kaikavian dialect, and, and, uh -oh. uh, and my dad took immense pride in that. He insisted that I learn that alone. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I had no idea. I thought I was speaking a normal language, but <laughs> I guess I'm, it's kind of like, I'm, it's kind of like, a how do y'all? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was in Zagreb uh, two or three years ago, and yeah. it, it's like a, a fairy tale city. The way they've rebuilt it, and it, it's just absolutely oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm happy to be here. It's where I was born, man. <laughs> just like Nina. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's awesome. It feels great. It feels great. I mean, it's great to be on Halat. Halat is the most beautiful place in the world, but. This is home. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow, it's pretty cool, gentlemen. I better check out. We're we're gonna head up the road, man. Okay. What a treat, what a treat guys! This was man, a nice was... surprise. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. hanging out. It's hangoutology. Postrav is uh, New Yorku. That's my Croatian. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> Five people. Ciao. It was a... Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Good to see you. Bye, Rod. See you, man. Bye, guys. Happy trail. Happy trails to you, David. All right, man. Stay in Happy trails. Doug, David. Bye, friend. I just want to say a last about Nenad Bach here that we have him. There's been a discussion about his uh, work. And uh, one in particular, I don't know if both of you have seen it, and it's, can we go higher? And um, this is during the time of the troubles there, the way the Irish talk about it, the war. And um, Nenad was interviewed by um, Ed Bradley on CBS for 60 Minutes, and there was a whole segment about it. And he pulled in so many creative people Nenad, who are all the, I mean, there were several people, I mean, household names, connections to some really amazing artists, really? and they all gave their heart and best yeah. for your Rich. cause. Martin Sheen, Michael York, uh, Rick Denko from the band, Garth Hudson from the band, Michael Penn, Indigo Girls, Ellen Burstyn, John Malkovich, Martin Sheen, a number of interesting people. Yeah. And Ed, Bad, and Ed Bradley, Bradley, was, Ed Bradley was the best. Yeah, he really knew how to interview and to describe and to interact with you, Nenad. I remember, and with the uh, issues at hand. Can, can, we find, you, can we find? Can we find that on YouTube? I think I, I have it in one of my press kits. Yes. Wonderful. You could send that to Nenad to David and to Doug. You can just check in Nenad Bach press kit and you will find oh, Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think we should wind down. Uh, it was a pleasure seeing you. It's uh, an hour that we don't stretch it too, for too long. And uh, I see Nidhi is, uh, is uh, leaving. She left. Uh, okay. And it's bedtime for you. It's, uh, for bedtime for me is when, when I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and David, for you, it's uh, your manager tells us that it's not much sleep every night. You are a night owl. 
I'm not a night owl. It's just that I run out of time. If we could just get a 36 hour day. Yeah. <laughs> I, I vote for 72 immediately. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's just wonderful to be with all of you, everybody. Doug, without you, I'd still be at the home. Well, actually, I couldn't be with my folks. They've passed away, but I'd still be at someone's home trying to figure out what to do the next day. And Nemet, you've always been, Nenet, you've always been an inspiration. And Radislav, I guess, had to go, but he's like incredible. And Michael, you were also someone who helps out so many other people and loves music and is an advocate for the arts and does something about it. So it's just wonderful. And I just hope all the people watching this will take what, and when, what Dr. Nitti said that was so beautiful and use that for yourself and continue to be creative, not to give up, to keep on trucking never to allow career counselors, lawyers, gurus, and other assorted people to dissuade you from the path that you feel you were chosen to be on. Whatever you to do to pay your rent has no bearing on your value as an artist or a person. And just to keep doing what you're doing and tell your story, because there's only one you, and that is a lot better than you're ever gonna to be told by advisors to develop so boys this is my record ah <laughs> a red one uh, uh we we meet again on october 5th that's tuesday first tuesday of the month uh, if you don't mind at the same time 4 p.m because i'm still in europe at the time uh, where, but, where, where will you be on october 5 october 5th uh, uh, somewhere between zagreb and rieka ah. yeah mm -hmm. So, and then I'm coming back on, on October 12th, and then I have a performance in, in Pomona in, on, on the one small stadium. Terrific. And, and David and I leave for Germany on October 13th. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I suggest that Murray Weinstock be with us for that occasion. He'll be back from Croatia, and he'll mm -hmm. let us know about his trip. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a pleasure seeing you and listening to you. Uh, uh, I think we, uh, my duty is to preserve uh, your wisdom and, uh, and uh, good vibes and good spirit and uh, uh, thoughtful uh, uh, sayings and, and, uh, and osmosis of living that we transfer to other people. We cannot teach them everything, but by osmosis, they will understand more. And this is a great tool. So we do it every month on the first Tuesday. Terrific. And I look forward to see you on the ping pong court too. Yeah, I, I, tomorrow is the third tournament in Berlin. It's a world championship of ping pong Parkinson. Wow. So, you better uh, get some sleep. I better get some sleep, you're right. Yes, get your strength. <laughs> I not need beauty sleep, but, but it will be sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great, great to see you, Nedded, and, and good luck in your tournament tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck, luck Nenad. Okay. All bye, the best. David. Bye, Doug. Bye, bye. All the best. And open that screenshot. Bye. Will do.